Okay, in this video, I'm going to continue on with my tutorials on differential equations. This is video number 34, and video 7 in the subsection on Laplace's equation. Specifically, I'm going to solve the azimuthal equation. In video 33, I derived the Laplacian in spherical coordinates, and in video 32, I solved the radial equation, which was a product of video 31, where I moved Laplace's equation from its rectangular coordinates to spherical coordinates and then applied the method of separation of variables where I broke the solution of three variables into a product of three single variable functions and when I plugged this into the actual Laplacian or the Laplace's equation we got instead of a partial differential equation three ordinary differential equations. The three ordinary differential equations we got were the radial equation, the azimuthal equation and the polar angle equation. So I'm going to solve the azimuthal equation in this video. In videos 20 through to 23, I discussed the first and second uniqueness theorems of Laplace's equation, and I also showed why it does not permit local maxima or minima. So in the bottom left of your screen, I've written in black the azimuthal equation. Notice that it is a function of the azimuthal angle phi. So I think before we continue, it's good just to remind ourselves of the, uh, the polar coordinate system. So that this be our z, our x, and our y axes. And we say that we have an arbitrary vector here of magnitude r. So we define the angle between the z-axis and the vector itself, theta, the polar angle. And if we project the vector onto the xy plane, we get the following line in drawn in solid black. That is the projection of r onto the xy plane. And we define the angle between this projection and the x-axis to be the azimuthal angle phi. Now immediately we can look at this and see what sort of boundary conditions we're going to have on this. Specifically we're going to have a periodic boundary condition because we want that the function for phi is unchanged if we move right around the z-axis and back to where we are. In other words we move small phi by, uh, by 2 pi. So we're left with the azimuthal equation, one of the three from the, from Laplace's equation, and we need to solve this for small for excuse me the function capital phi a function of small phi. This is a very straightforward equation to solve. It is a second order linear ordinary differential equation. So we take and we can rewrite it as the as the following: we have capital phi double prime plus b times capital phi is equal to zero. Now let's remind ourselves that b is a separation constant which we got from the method of separation of variables. To solve this we use the method of the characteristic equation. So we have minus 0 plus or minus the square root of 0 squared minus 4 times 1 times b. We need to divide this by twice a, which is twice 1. So that is, that, that is the characteristic equation and it'll help us solve the equation. If you're unsure what I did there, look at video number 25. So the solution for capital phi, a function of small phi, is a constant, let's say capital N, times e to the i times the square root of capital B times small phi. So that's one, that's one solution. And then we add another linearly independent solution with a constant, let's call it capital M, and then we have e to the minus i times the square root of b, and we have small phi. So we're after getting the general solution for the azimuthal equation. But in order to make it useful for us, or to us, we need to apply boundary conditions. So as I said a moment ago, the obvious boundary conditions to apply on the azimuthal angle, or the azimuthal function, is that it is periodic when you move 2 pi, or you got periodic boundary conditions. So to write that mathematically, what we have is as follows. If we have our function capital phi and we evaluate it at a certain angle small phi, it should be the same if we evaluate it at small phi plus 2 pi. So that is the definition of a periodic boundary condition. Very straightforward, but it's what comes out of it that it's actually very interesting. So let's look for example at our first solution. So we had e to the i times the square root of b times small phi. That means this is unchanged 
if we do the following, if e to the i is square root of b, and we have small phi plus 2 pi. Now, this is correct. Of course it's going to be correct. The only thing we need to look at in order to ensure that it remains correct is that the square root of b is an integer. Now, you might need to sit back and think about this for a moment. But if the condition that phi is, that e to the i phi is equal to e to the i phi plus 2 pi, that is, that is true. But if b, or the square root of b, was not an integer, integer, then this condition would not hold. So what this implies is that the square root of b, the square root of b, is an integer. And it's, it's by convention that we call this particular integer m. I'm sure you'd have seen people give it a subscript as well, m sub s. So if you're talking about quantum mechanics, you would call this the magnetic quantum number. So for example, if you applied the method of separation of variables to the Schrodinger equation, um, which or to the wave function and Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom, you'll find that you get an m sub s, a magnetic quantum number. So the limits on m sub s are as follows. m sub s, well, it can be zero, can be plus or minus one, can be plus or minus two or anything up to infinity or, or negative infinity as it is. So like I said, m sub s is the magnetic quantum number. So that's how you solve the azimuthal equation. Thanks for watching. Please pass it on to your friends, subscribe to my channel, and you might also give me a comment in the comment box below.